Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, GCP, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, Ryan, and Peter. Episode 105, recorded on February 17th, 2021. The Cloud Pod's heart is a flutter with Space Edge. Good evening, Peter and Ryan. We are missing Jonathan tonight, but uh, we have the two of you who are just as good. So, so. Nah, not quite, you know, but you know. Take what you can get, I think. Someone get Jonathan. I even out have of bed. a joke about Jonathan in the, in the show notes later he's gonna miss. So <laughs> just, yeah, I'll enjoy it without him. That's all right though. We will miss him dearly. Uh, yes. Well, we are busy as usual. You know, Amazon woke up a little bit this week, but uh Azure was busy this week for sure. So we've got a lot to cover on the Azure front this week, which is great. And so we will get into it right now with Amplify Flutter is now generally available to let you build beautiful cross-platform apps. So for those of you who know what Amplify is, which is none of us on the cloud podcast, we've talked about it before, it's a set of tools and services for building secure, scalable mobile and web apps supporting iOS, Android, and JavaScript. And it's a quick and easy way to build your apps on AWS. Flutter is Google's UI toolkit for building natively compiled web, mobile, and desktop apps from a single code base and is one of the fastest growing mobile frameworks out there, apparently, because I had never heard of it. So Amazon is marrying them together with two opaque technologies together to become Amplify Flutter, and is designed for customers who are invested in Flutter and want to take advantage of AWS. The service gives you a GraphQL API backed by AWS AppSync, as well as REST APIs and handlers using Amazon API Gateway and AWS Lambda. It provides Amplify data store to leverage shared and distributed data without writing additional code for offline online scenarios, and gives you the hosted UI, which is a great way to implement auth via Cognito and other social capabilities, allowing you to power your signups, sign-ins, and MFA capabilities, as well as natively interface to S3 and Pinpoint, if you don't know what that service is, that's also a service for mobile that no one uses. Available today in all regions and support Amplify at no additional cost, getting your Flutter on in the cloud. Every time I go through these, I realize how hard like mobile development and front end engineers have it. Like it's so much easier. Like the challenges of scale on the back end and everything, but I don't have to deal with the user going in and out of service, for instance. So <laughs> <laughs> I definitely know if I was to redo my career as a developer, I would be a back-end developer, not a front-end developer. Because the you know just even when I do PowerPoint and I had to line up boxes, I want to murder <laughs> everyone. So I could only imagine trying to do that in code as a front-end developer. Like, you know, the, the product manager wants that box moved through these pixels. And I'd be like, screw you, product manager. <laughs> the neat thing about these services is that they're clearly the hard part for those front-end developers is the back-end. Because that's what they're making so much easier. I wonder, yeah, I mean, it's. I think it goes to your skill set, right? So Amazon's doing a really wonderful job of automating away things outside of your skill set. So manage Elasticsearch, manage this, manage that, you know, Kibana, Grafana, you know, all these things, like, just so you don't have to. Yeah, now you've got your API gateway, Lambdas, databases, everything just sort of up and running for you, authentication, and you just write your app. Amazon EKS is now going to support a use case that I'm not really familiar with. Apparently, in some companies, developers aren't allowed to access Amazon web consoles in any way, shape, or form. And so that makes it difficult for them to apparently manage Kubernetes. And so Amazon is now supporting them with the user authentication for OIDC, allowing you to directly authenticate to your Kubernetes cluster using an OIDC provider like Cognito, or any other of the many, many other OIDC OAuth2 partners that are out there. This is supported on any Kubernetes cluster version 1.16 and above, and is available to you now. So that's a weird use case, but if you need it, there it is. <laughs> well, it's one of those like weird things, like how do you, you know, you have kube control and all these things that the Kubernetes API empowers, but then if you don't really do access management correctly, you can effectively leave a pretty bad security hole in your deployment. So while I don't exactly get this, I can see its value. Yeah. I almost wonder if it's a way you could then implement like your own platform as a service layer or you know, integrate this into something else. So you could, you know, use those tools to basically manage a Kubernetes cluster without having to have that Amazon IAM permissions, which I guess maybe is a one way to do it. But yeah, a really interesting feature. I'm not entirely sure what the use case of it is. But I did just mention support on one one six and above, and that's because one one five is now officially end of life because Amazon has now dropped support for one one nine, and so as you know, they only support the last three versions, current and the two priors, and so now with this announcement, you have one one five. You need to get off that cluster. 
before too late. 119 brings you some new features, including the Ingress API, the pod topology spreader, the endpoint slices enabled by default, and immutable secrets and config maps all available to you. I did also track this if this is behind. It is still. 1.20 is the latest branch, stable branch that came out. Uh, 118 was released in October of 2020 for EKS, and Kubernetes released 119 in August 26th of 2020. So my rough math on that is that they are still about six months behind. So they're definitely not picking up the pace, which is one of the things we talked about last year when they said they were, you know, redid their entire pipeline so they could support newer versions of Kubernetes much faster. So it's still about six months behind, which, you know, is maybe the right thing to be if you don't want to be bleeding edge, but I still have to see an early access channel available. Wasn't six months... Like, it used to be uh, like a huge I, improvement. Yeah, it is a huge improvement over what it was, which was like nine. It was almost a year between, I think, one one two and one one three. So, like, it's definitely an improvement, but you know, it could definitely be better. It could be, but that said, I've had zero customers ask us to build them like Kubernetes on EC two because they needed the latest version and couldn't get it on EKS. So, I mean, I think the question is how bleeding edge are you and do you really need these features that are not super stable and one two oh and one two one and if you do really need those then i wonder what you're doing (laughs) maybe this isn't the right solution for you because if i'm building enterprise software on top of kubernetes i probably want stable versus fancy flashy bleeding edge features yeah if you're developing against those you're probably developing something or you know directly to support or control or administer (laughs) kubernetes itself and you're trying to stay ahead of it are you in that situation where developers are just picking what they want to pick and not thinking ahead about supportability. Well, if you've uh, ever had to push more data to Amazon than the typical 10 gig dedicated direct connect circuit will provide to you, you could do that with provisioning multiple 10 gig circuits. And then of course, having to manage multiple 10 gig circuits and the routing between these different circuits and really kind of a pain. And Amazon said, you know, we're, we're going to fix that for you with the new 100 gigabit support via the linked aggregation groups feature without the operational overhead and support of multiple 10 gig links. This is now available to you in select regions. So do check the supported matrix for that to make sure that it is supported if you need this kind of throughput. But uh, if you do, you now have the ability to do it on a single connection, although they do highlight heavily in this article. You should have multiple of these because if one goes down, 100 gigabits of traffic is a lot to shove over the Internet or some other path. And so definitely make sure you have a couple of these for redundancy reasons but this is now available to you. I did notice the pricing is scaling very linearly. With 10 gigs of direct connect cost costing you $2.25 an hour, while the 100 gigabit will cost you twenty two fifty, which is exactly 10 times the price. So well done, Amazon. Yeah. No discount for more data. That's all I thought. Yeah. I mean, but also declarative and easy to forecast. Other than the data transfer cost that's on top of that price. <laughs> yeah. Did that make you nostalgic, though? The first time you heard about an OC3 and 155 megabits per second sounded like infinite bandwidth. And now you can have 100 gig direct connect. Moving on to uh, GCP. You can now discover and invoke services across clusters with GKE multi-cluster services. And this is because you hate yourself. Or you have people like Security or Ryan Lucas or some other person that said it's the right thing to do <laughs> by separating your concerns. And so you have applications that now span multiple Kubernetes clusters. And this is great, except for now you can't use any of the native primitives of Kubernetes like service discovery because they'll only work inside of one cluster. So Google has your back if you're using GKE. With the release of the MCS service, or MCS for short, a Kubernetes native cross-cluster service discovery and invocation mechanism for a Google Kubernetes service. MCS extends the reach of Kubernetes service primitives beyond the cluster boundary, so you can easily build Kubernetes apps that span clusters. It leverages the same technology and environs of a cluster, the same technology using Traffic Director, and Google Cloud's fully managed enterprise-grade platform for global app networking. MCS also integrates with multi-cluster ingress for multi-cluster load balancing for both east-west and north-south traffic flows, making your troubleshooting world much, much harder if you're using this. (laughs) I see this as a game changer. I think that this is, you know, one of those things that you're getting your cake and eating it too, as far as, you know, separation of duties, separation of concerns, blast radius, but then also, you know, the biggest complaint I ever get from users of Kubernetes is, you know, to do that, you have to, you get rid of a lot of the advantages and, you know, the the advantages are what make the developer experience so powerful. And so they're adding this back and not really removing a whole lot of, you know, functionality, you know, from it. So this is fantastic. This is the type of feature that would sway me over 
you know, a cloud provider if I was, you know, looking to land my Kubernetes based app somewhere. Doesn't it feel a bit self defeating, though, in the fact that you partition, you look for, you know, you create multiple clusters to protect from single points of failure. And then you build a control plane that controls all of the clusters, which then creates a single point of failure. Well, so the control plane failing doesn't necessarily mean that your applications fail. They are distinct. And so that's sort of the the trick there is that you're sort of compartmentalizing a little bit. You know, yeah, you won't be able to make any updates or maybe scale might be a problem. It's actually something I hadn't really thought about, how you could use this in a multi-region type architecture to not have a global Kubernetes cluster, which would be awful to maintain and manage <laughs> because of etcd in the background. But you could definitely, you know, use this and then kind of use these cross-region ingress load balancers to kind of help cover some of that. There's definitely some use cases for it and as much as I make fun of it. There's there's value in shrinking the size of your Kubernetes cluster, other than the fact that this is a GKE, so every cluster costs you money. Thanks, Google. You know, regardless of what you're doing with other products. Well, if you like that feature and you like service discovery, but you're like, I use other Amazon or Google services that I'd like to, you know, also discover, Google is making the service directory generally available to you to simplify your service inventory capabilities. Last year, this was announced in beta. We talked about it a little bit then, but it was still pretty early. So this is now generally available for all Google Cloud customers. Service directory allows you to easily register these services to a single fully managed registry, building a rich ecosystem of services and uplevel your environment from an infrastructure centric to a service centric model. Several benefits of the service cover include the ability to make human-friendly service naming. So instead of service-b3ada17a-9ada-46b2, which just rolls off the tongue, you can name it Jonathan's Moneymaker. <laughs> then, oh, where's Jonathan? <laughs> I know, Jonathan's not here. Then you can enrich service data with additional properties. So you can annotate service names to clearly differentiate the services, things like experimental or HIPAA compliant. Or in our scenario here for Jonathan's Moneymaker, investments, Bitcoin speculation, and shady dealings. And then you can easily resolve services from a variety of clients, including RESTful interfaces, gRPC, and DNS lookups, as well as updated internal DNS records as Jonathan's Bitcoin mining fleet auto scales up and down. And finally, this is all fully managed for you by Google, meaning Jonathan just makes money while he sleeps, meaning you don't need to do much other than figure your items. They did add a new feature as this did leave beta. If we talked about this in the past and you remember that, they did add the ability to automatically register service features without having to write any orchestration code, which is pretty nice. This feature is available to you for internal TCP, UDP, and internal HTTPS load balancers and will be extended to other products in the future and as simple as adding a flag to a load balancing forwarder rule that says auto register service so is jonathan really just sleeping right now is that why he's yeah. not here yeah. i mean he's making money i mean he's, he's got his, his service discovery system just making money for him all day long he doesn't have to be here anymore he knows how it works I can't believe it yeah okay. he told me to install those agents on my boxes and sounds like he's just using it for bitcoin mining <laughs> Yeah, sure. Performance has been terrible ever since I did that. Now that you mentioned, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so weird. <laughs> oh dear, this is Worker B three A D A one seven A nine A D A four six B two checking in. Looks like we've been busted. Uninstalling. Hey everyone, Jonathan here. I just wanted to take a minute to thank the cloud consulting gurus at Foghorn for helping make the cloud pod possible. These folks truly get it. Cloud consulting experts since 2008, they are premier tier partners with AWS, Google Cloud Platform Silver, and Microsoft Azure partners. From multi-cloud to containers to moving full production workloads to the cloud under the tightest compliance, Foghorn's team of full-stack cloud engineers have been there, done that, gotten the t-shirt, and are ready to share their experience with you. If you're in the market for some talent to supplement your team, visit www.fogops.io slash thecloudpod www.fogops.io slash the cloud pod foghorn the promise of cloud delivered well google is uh giving you the freedom of choice with a new six or nine terabyte ssd capability that you can attach to your local compute engine vm to giving you the ultimate iops per dollar capability of the google cloud this is attachable to the second gen general purpose n2 compute engine which will support up to 2.4 million IOPS and 9.4 gigabytes of throughput direct attached latencies on V2 VM and with 24 or more vCPUs. And since these VMs support custom shapes, you can define the exact VM that your app needs in terms of CPU, RAM, and SSD, which I thought was sort of funny because they highlighted this fact that you can you know, do one CPU and five gigs of memory, and then you can attach your disk space to it. I'm like, yeah, but you're not actually giving me any choice in the disk space. I only get six or nine. <laughs> if I only needed one terabyte, you're like, screw you, dude. You can't, we're custom to a point. <laughs> uh, but they did try to highlight that in the article, which I thought was a little, a little funny because you can't be quite that customized. Yeah. 
I mean, I do like, you know, being able to, to roll your own flavors of these VMs. But in, you know, what I find more funny is the way this article is written, you know, sort of trying to make SSDs and IOPS exciting, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of charts and pretty graphs in this article. It's a, pretty, it's a decent article to check out. You know, I think if I ever was a big Google customer and I was using this particular feature where I'm custom shaping me, I would make sure I did all of the odd CPU combinations. Like, I like five CPUs, seven. <laughs> Just all prime numbers. I want yeah. all prime numbers. And then I like really weird combinations of RAM, like not 256. I'm only going to do like 243 just because, you know, <laughs> just to be that guy. That's what I'm going to be so just someday. <laughs> well, let's get to our lengthy list of Azure news here. With first up, the Azure firewall has gone premium. Woo! They give you premium disk. They give you premium support. They give you premium blobs. Now, premium firewalls available to you in preview is designed for your highly sensitive and regulated environments. The Azure Firewall Premium gives you TLS inspection, which is Azure Firewall Premium turns outbound and east-west TLS connections so they can inspect them. An IDPS, which is a signature-based intrusion and prevention system, all built in. Web categories, which allow administrators to filter outbound user access to the internet based on categories, for example, social networking, search engines, gambling, and so on and so forth, as well as URL filtering and new features will be deployed as policy only. So these will all go into effect right now on your premium firewall if you've enabled it, but they will not start doing anything special until you enable that capability. So this is available to you for no additional cost beyond the Azure firewall premium cost that you're paying. Can you imagine going to security at this point like your security review and trying to explain why you chose the firewall standard versus the premium to protect your new workload. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to do that scenario. No. That sounds awful. <laughs> yeah. I like to just have these features available to me at a slightly higher, you know, per gigabyte transfer cost, which is how Amazon would do it. Well, Microsoft apparently was paying attention during the elections and learned a lot about Fulton and Douglas counties. <laughs> As you know, they were very important in the election <laughs> Uh, and so Azure has decided that they will build their next data center region in Georgia, which will become the East US3 region. And they will build that in with a presence in both Fulton and Douglas counties, making sure they catch, cover both uh, voting blocks. This is a significant investment in the region, which goes on top of their new office space in Atlantic Yards and plans to add even more space in the future. This will put Atlanta on the path to being one of their largest hubs in the United States in the coming decades after the Puget Sound region and Silicon Valley. As always, Azure highlights existing customers who can benefit from this capability in this region. And this comes after the recent that they will be expanding the South Central region for additional availability zones and the upcoming launch of West US3 in Arizona. So that means I think they have uh, now three on the West Coast and three on the East Coast and two in the Central region. So that's quite a bit of coverage for the United States, which is pretty nice if you're looking for that from Microsoft Azure. So not only did Georgia go blue, but they win Azure. It did. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, nice. Hey-o. You yeah. could have come up with that for the show title earlier, could you? Yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to flunk out a lightning round, too. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, we talked about, I think, previously on the show, about the space initiatives from both Amazon and Azure, and we mercilessly made fun of both of them and how ridiculous they sort of were. And then I think Jonathan actually mentioned on that, you know, they really need computers in space. So the cloud should be in space, on satellites or whatever else. And Azure, I can tell you now, is going to space. With their newly announced partnership with HPE and the upcoming launch of the Spaceborne Computer 2, or SBC-2, which will deliver edge computing and artificial intelligence capabilities for the first time to the International Space Station. All I can see here is this is Skynet, guys. <laughs> Putting AI on the space station this is just bad news. <laughs> The SBC2 is built on the HP Edgeline Converge Edge systems that is engineered for harsh edge environments that will enable additional capabilities to connect to Azure workloads to the ultimate edge. Ultimate edge being space, of course. HP and Microsoft plan to use this cloud capability in space to handle weather modeling of dust storms on Mars for future missions, plant on hydroponic analysis to support food growth and life sciences in space, and medical imaging using ultrasound to support astronaut healthcare while in space. The SBC2 will launch on February 20th, which is in a couple days from now, aboard the 15th Northrop Grumman resupply mission to the space station. And there's a quote here from Dr. Mark Fernandez, Solutions Architect of Converged Edge Systems at HPE and Principal Investigator for Spaceborne Computer 2. HPE and Microsoft are collaborating to further accelerate space exploration by delivering state-of-the-art technologies to tackle a range of data processing needs while in orbit. By bringing together HPE's Spaceborne Computer 2, which is based on the HP Edgeline Converge Edge system for advanced edge computing and AI capabilities, with Microsoft Azure to connect to the cloud, we are enabling space explorers to seamlessly transmit large data sets to and from Earth and benefit from an edge-to-edge -edge cloud experience. And we look forward to collaborating with Microsoft on their Azure space efforts, with, which share our vision to accelerate discovery and help make breath breakthroughs to support life and sustainability in the future extending human missions to space. 
And all I can think is just one, like they should have done like 20 of them. Then they could heat the whole ISS with that. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> you could replace all those heaters. Yes. Yeah. Server racks of Azure running windows containers. So I just realized you get involved in this. HPE, I assume. Well, a Microsoft and HP have had a pretty strong relationship for decades. You know, one of the initial launch partners of Windows 2000 and many other things. So I think that makes sense that HP and Azure would be partnered up pretty good on this. But how HP gets the space, I don't know. That's probably a government contract gone wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they just had the right, you know, converge package that made this make sense. And like the serverless edge computing device maybe makes sense. And you know, who knows, maybe other vendors are going to do something similar in the future, which is the first one to go up. And here we go. The next I one forget that listeners SpaceX. can't look at I always forget that people can't see my face as I'm like struggling not to laugh when I say these things. <laughs> so we're not live. We're not on video. Thank God. Thank God. Uh, and our final Azure story, you can now back up Linux virtual machines running mission critical workloads. Azure has added the ability to back up Linux systems with the Azure backup agent. The agent has several improvements for Linux, including consistent backup of Linux virtual machines, including app consistent crash backups. If you don't want to have agents on your Linux box, because who wants that? They can also offer you Azure disk backups and an agentless crash consistent backup for Azure managed disk with the ability to configure multiple backups per day, as well as Azure backup now supports Postgres SQL which gives you long-term retention for backups and Azure backup offers you enterprise grade security and governance capabilities that help enterprises meet their data protection goals. It's one of the services that is such a no brainer for cloud providers to offer. Rigging your own is so miserable and so fraught with error. This is one of my favorite managed services, Amazon, Azure. I don't care what platform it is. I want a GUI and I want my backup scheduled and I want to know that they're good. Yeah, I completely agree. The less time I spend thinking about this, the better. And but it's one of those things that if I don't have it, you know, I, I know it's going to bite me one day. And so, make it easy, make it ubiquitous, make it automatic. You know, show up and take my money, I guess, for backups. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. We found a super interesting feature on Amazon's cloud where when you do a Amazon backup and then do a copy to a different region, obviously for DR. And then set the copy to never expire. Instead of never expiring, it inherits the retention feature from the original. And so we had like one day, one day retention and then copy it and then never expire. And then it's like, why aren't there any backups in the DR region? Because <laughs> uh -oh. it was deleting them, deleting yeah. them after one day. Yeah. Oops. Oops. Yeah. That's maybe if your RTO Thank is, you know, is 15 minutes. You know, Thank goodness we figured that out before there was a problem. <laughs> well that is it for new news this week you want to take us to lightning round peter i would love to let's start with automatic azure vm extension upgrade capabilities are now in public preview making me just you know remember all those days in vmware world where i had to update vmware tools because of silly reasons and now it's gonna be automated for me in azure vm because they're just vms huh so weird yeah upgrade my capabilities all right Yes. As your backup for SAP HANA, the soft limit has been increased from two terabytes to eight terabytes, the best use of memory ever. And if I ever have to support this the database of two terabytes to eight terabytes in HANA, please put me out of my misery. All right, support this or pay for this? Both. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> eight terabytes of memory. Awesome. <laughs> Pass. Azure Databricks achieves DoD impact level five on Microsoft Azure government. Hmm. Wonder what that's for. Maybe a Jedi or two. Star Wars. AWS Fargate increases default resource count service quotas to a thousand. If you want, <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> ah, ah. <laughs> I thought, thought you said I, I had one coming. job and I totally whiffed on it. I didn't have anything for that one, so I was letting you take that. So. <laughs> you know what's great is this is recorded. We could just start it over. Again. Yeah, I we think should. you had one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No? Okay. Well, we're gonna leave it. We're gonna leave it in the show notes just like this. So we, yeah, because <laughs> shame <Perfect>. is public. <laughs> yeah. You can update the content of inbound and outbound emails which is super creepy, using AWS Lambda in Amazon Workmail. I guess, I mean, you can just make an email itself, I guess, that way you get some volume on this, because that bill is going to be zero for most customer of uh, Workmail. 
So there's no customers. Think of the complexity of my email signature that I can put on this though. I'm going to have like multi Lambda orchestrated, you know, imagery added to like every outbound email. You know that some companies have those trailing footers that basically are like, this email is proprietary to the company mm-hmm. you're working, you know, you who received it from blah, blah. It's so like, this is a way you can inject that. But I was actually, I can actually remove it with this too. Mm-hmm. I can get rid of it. So that way I don't have to see it in every email I've ever responded to. to somebody or else. 27 times in the same yeah. email thread, that kind exactly. of thing. Although I think I would randomize this so that I would have like, you know, every unicorn GIF that I could ever find on the internet. And I would just put that as my, I don't think that's how I'm going to use this. There's all kinds of bad use cases too. Like I can remove URLs from these and, or I can add words into the URL that people have to remove manually to prevent phishing and all that. Like there are so many bad scenarios of how you could abuse this. And I just, ugh. that's what it's for, right? Is anti-phishing. I can only oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. But again, like who uses this? I mean, like who, what customer is demanding that- this feature? That's what I would try <laughs> to figure out. That one enterprise IT architect who's like, no, work mail. All in one place, damn it. <laughs> one vendor. AWS WAF adds support for JSON parsing and inspection. I mean, clearly someone at the WAF team was like, you know, we need to spend more money processing just ridiculous amounts of binary data and JSON objects for some reason. And so that's why they have this feature. I assume they're going to charge for this soon, right? Like data processing through the WAF is going to go through the roof. Like, I don't know. Yeah, this one's confusing to me. I don't see anything good from this. Only bad. <laughs> what bad? I get maybe not anything great or good, but <laughs> what bad could come out of this? Oh, I, I mean, if your rules are based on the parsing of that object, like that's going to be complex. And I just, I don't know why you'd put the, the complexity at the enforcement layer here for that kind of thing. I don't know. For code injection, like it's sort of just bending the rules of what I think a web access firewall should be. Just basically allowing developers to be more and more lazy by taking care of it. <laughs> things at the WAF. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Oh, okay, I'm in. I could see the bad. Amazon Simple Email Service launches a redesigned service console experience, which undoubtedly will get rave reviews from our undoubtedly. Yes. Host. You know, I meant to go look at it when I wrote the show notes up for this, and I forgot. But I can pretty much guarantee I probably hate it. <laughs> If it's like any other ones. So I'll, I'll try to look at it sometime next week and we'll talk about it next week. But I assume it's we bad. I, there's mention about it trying to fix the DCAM workflow and a bunch of stuff in the press release. And I was like, yeah, this is going to be horrendous. It's going to be whizzy. It's going to be like Route 53 all over again. Like, we're going to give you a wizard to do DCAM. Like, great. Thank you. Here's 27 questions to validate your domain. I mean, we could do it live right now on the show. Like, <laughs> That's actually not a bad idea. You can get a live readout of how I feel about it. Let's go through the lightning round. I'll, we'll do a live readout here. So. AWS scheduled actions of application auto scaling now support local time zones. Uh, so I'm super glad to no longer have to have 9 a.m. outages when someone set the five o'clock downscaling, which works out to be 9 a.m. Pacific time and 5 p.m. Mm. UTC, which is a bummer. Every time Oops. Happens. See, what I always screw up is the, the Sunday, the fact that it's Sunday and UTC time first. And so when I'm trying to do the dates, that's what I get every single time. Yep. I learned that living in Australia, where you're <laughs> oh. seven hours behind, but a day ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah, a day ahead. <laughs> it's two different directions of math, and I'm out. Amazon Aurora Global Database supports managed planned failover. Because everyone loves a good planned failover. I don't always fail over, but when I do, <laughs> it's managed. And planned. Oh, it's supposed to be planned. <laughs> no, you were going to wait if you said it's planned. I know. It was so close. Oh, so close. <laughs> Amazon VPC traffic mirroring is now supported on select non-Nitro instance types. I mean, like how much is this to slow down my network traffic? Like, because the reason why it's so fast now is because it's not part of the virtual machine. But now you're going to take up host-based processing to give me VPC traffic mirroring? I don't know about this. Nothing. I got nothing. Yeah, I don't get it. Yeah, yeah, it's (laughs) over my head. (laughs) And to round out the round, AWS Cloud9 launches visual source control integration for Git. Which, I mean, great. This is awesome. I now realize that the true test of all good source code management and, you know, products like this is that visual source views of Git. Like, it's like SQL interfaces for NoSQL. Like, this is the moment you know that you really arrived is when your, you know, your editor of choice now gives you visual Git edits. You know, so you can see what's visually changed because you can't figure it out from the command line. That's my new litmus test. What's the alternative? Auditory? 
Like they give you there's a sound. Bunch. Oh yeah, the sound. Yeah, like read like, out the diffs. <laughs> yeah. I can you imagine <laughs> reading that out. <laughs> Red comma dash four. <laughs> Line, 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 line thirty. Visual. Negative. You know, Ryan is using code. <laughs> Plus, Ryan is not using code. <laughs> uh, In like a horrible like computer voice. Oh yeah, for sure. It had to be. Mm-hmm. There's probably an untapped market for just like really annoying software products we could build. Like, n- not only do they not provide any value, but they actively annoy you. I think that maybe this is how maybe I make Morse code. Yeah. Maybe Morse code would be an alternative. I don't know. You can take my Git CLI from my cold dead hands. I'm sorry, uh, Ryan. It was a so valiant nice. effort. I know. But uh, I'm going to have to give that one to Justin. It was like a flurry of punches. I won't even like that. I, I mean, I almost wouldn't give myself a point anyways. Just, <laughs> just for Someone's got to win. Someone's got to win. I'll take it. I'll take the point. I'll take it. All right, I have logged into my account for the Cloud Pod, and I am looking at the SES console, which I thought at first, like, well, it doesn't look that different. That's because I had to go click the button that said use the new console experience, because at least it let me opt in versus this one having to opt out. So it is using the new collapsible sidebar on the left, which I absolutely hate. Every time I see this collapsible sidebar, I'm like, where's where's the thing I already configured? And it's like, all I see is create something in this big, you know, orange box, which is what you get here, of course, in the SES thing, which is, you know, send your first email by creating an identity, because that's how I want to send my first email right there in orange on the front. So, you know, if you've never seen this console before and didn't know it was already configured, you're now here creating an identity for no reason, because you didn't realize to hit the little hamburger button to expand the left-hand side to go actually see your account. So that's annoying, number one, for sure. And then they give you a nice video here on the front page of how it works. You can, If you don't know what SES is, I don't know how you ended up on this page. But if you did, this will now tell you what you're doing here and what it's for. And then they have benefits, use cases, and quick links to all the great documentation, which I do like this kind of landing page thing. I just wish, I actually hate this button thing they do where they getting started is like the most basic part of getting started when I'm just trying to figure out what I have configured. So then, you know, on the left-hand side, once I figure out the hamburger button, because, you know, who doesn't love a good hamburger button as your UI element? The account dashboard is the first one up, which gives you, you know, basically the same dashboard as you had before with a nice little skin wrapper, daily email usage, sending quotas, you know, your SMTP settings, a quick link to create your SMTP thing. Nothing special here. You can request your limit increase right from here now, which is pretty nice. And then they've added a new reputation metrics button, which if you're using the new configuration sets, this is important because this is where all of your reputation goes to. And so you can see based on which configuration set your reputation bounce rates, complaint rates, et cetera, and links you directly into CloudWatch as a team link. So I don't hate that either. And then we go into where I, configuration is where we have failed us all. So verified identities, I can create an identity, which gives me a wizard. <laughs> I can create my identity type by domain or by email address. I had to enter my domain. I can assign a default configuration set. I can use a custom mail from domain, which is nice, which requires DMARC. So then when you click that, it expands it. Then you click this, I want this. And if it's not from this, you want to reject it. And then you have DKIM setups, which is, you know, provide your own DKIM authentication token or just enable it. And then you can do tagging all in this. Well. But nothing is automatically expanded. Everything is shrunk until you click on different boxes. So you can't just see everything you need to know. You have to click through and find all the sharp edges before you'll be able to fully create that verified identity. Then your configuration sets, which are new. We talked about these a couple weeks ago on the show. These are all here. Very basic stuff. Rotation metrics, account level, configuration setting, tags. Very similar to the email sending. And then the dedicated IP, which is also a new feature if you haven't been in here in a while. It gives you the ability to request your dedicated IP right here with a quick click, which you can then put into a configuration set to basically get dedicated IP pools. And then uh, blessed be the person who put use the old console as the very bottom box on this thing, which then says, do I want to give them feedback, which I will send them a link to the podcast once it's published. Uh, And that'll be my (laughs) feedback for the SES team. But that's it. That's basically the new console. It's not really that much different. I think it's actually missing some things still. So like they haven't moved over suppression list removals. They haven't brought over the email templates or some of that stuff yet. So you will be bouncing back and forth between the old console and the new console. But, you know, it looks very similar to the other console changes they've made recently. And I don't like it. So there you go. <laughs> Zero to ten. Rank. I'll give this one a two. It's better than the uh, Route 53, but not much. So nah, Route 53 is... was a one. I'll give this a two. Wow. Brutal. I will say that this one's better. For me, like the old one did seem old and dated. You know, and it's, you know, this one gives you a lot more data. If you like, if you go to the reputation dashboard and it's instead of just being like a green word, you know, you actually see where you are and where they're measuring you. That's I mean, I mean, that all there me before. Like yeah, I don't have the anger quotient like I did for the Route 53, but I definitely 
I don't think this is an improvement, which, you know, again, who uses these anyways, right? You just, I think that's why I like it is they didn't change much, right? Yeah. Just I mean, so far, but I mean, again, yeah. they're missing still like 20 features that are yeah, good point. in the old one that aren't in the new one yet. So there's still plenty of time to screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> my biggest problem is it's 830 my time right now, and the hamburger button is making me hungry because I haven't eaten anything. <laughs> You know, uh, you can set your auto scaling group to a local time zone action now based on that time that it's 830 there and you want to go to bed or go get food. So you can decide that auto scaling to just turn off the podcast recording. So. Yeah. Really. <laughs> <laughs> can I put the other host to sleep? Just sleep. <laughs> sleep, Justin. Sleep, Ryan. That'd be awesome. All right. Well, we don't want to keep you from a meal because that's important. And it's cold where you're at. Not Texas, but still in the Midwest, oh, which is that's right. You're in deep, the middle of the country. Oh, uh, way deep colder frozen. here than Texas. It's just uh, we're supposed to be. Like people here are supposed to be more prepared for it, but I'm from California. So minus 15 and minus 25 or 30 wind chill was, uh, yeah, that was a rude awakening. That was not in the brochure. That's yeah. I'm pretty sure that when I, if I was in Kansas city and I was sitting there watching the television news and they said there was going to be negative 10 and I knew I had a home to go to back there in California, I would literally get up, grab my bag and I would go to the airport and just fly. Yes. Back. Like I w- instead I hung out in the basement with a hairdryer, unfreezing my pipes. It's a pretty impressive story. All right. Well, this is your last chance to sign up for Microsoft Ignite March 2nd through 4th digital. This should come out before that. So if you haven't signed up, you have literally 24 hours probably by the time this episode drops to go sign up and watch it. So do that before it's too late if you're interested in Microsoft Ignite to learn all about the Azure Premium Firewall features and Azure Space. So check those out if you're interested. And again, it's been another fantastic week in the cloud. We will see you next week. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. Good night. Bye, everybody. And that is The Week in Cloud. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Foghorn Consulting. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and tweet us your feedback at hashtag thecloudpod. Or join our Slack channel, go to our website, thecloudpod.net, for sign-up instructions. (laughs) 